probably December, George was delivering one night and he stopped us and had a bowl of soup and we sat and chatted and it really struck me just, you know, the, the care for the animals and the whole system they have at the farm and it was something that kind of, you know, these people need to be supported for what they do and, you know, what they do is what we believe in as well and, you know, sometimes, you know, it's hard for restaurants to write those checks on slow weeks when you buy local because it's not always cheap. But when you get to talk to them like I hope you guys get to do tonight, you get to see that these people need to be supported, they need to be on their menu, and they need to have their stories told. Then we also have Jeremy and uh, Sheila from Pitchfork Organics. Uh, Jeremy's produce is always by far some of the best product we ever come through the door and I think from talking to Jeremy, I really, what I like about him is I think he's happiest in his field farming. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's you much of a schmoozer, schmooze. not much of a talker, and I'm a lot like that. I would rather be in the kitchen cooking than schmoozing and doing that kind of thing. So um, we really appreciate the work they do and the product they bring. Um, even tonight, I mean, he went out and they picked... Uh, I don't know what kind of weeds they were for the salad. But like <laughs> <laughs> the plentiful ones. The plentiful ones, right? So, you know, we're very lucky to be have these guys here, and um, they support the business so much. You know, Jeremy does. These guys come for lunch. They've been to dinner. They've done the chef's table. Um, so tonight uh, you'll get to enjoy some of the vegetables and the eggs that uh, they brought for us. And then something new that we've done with this gumbu dinner we've never done before. And the idea kind of, I think, started probably a year or so ago. Shannon comes back one night and says, Bill wants to know why his name's not on the chalkboard. In the nicest <laughs> manner. The nicest <laughs> manner. So, it, you know, it became apparent there's a lot of local businesses that support us, that support local, owned by local, that they need a little bit of recognition as well. So we have Bill and Patricia from Stuffers. And this place, I mean, we get our sausage casings, they have spices, the wood chips, smokers, you name it, sausage grinders, stuffers. We had our old sous chef used to love it when he had to pick up an order because he would go in there and he would always leave with something. And I think most of our cooks have bought knives there. And it really is a fun place to go. There's books on sausage making and all that kind of stuff as well, which I know is becoming really popular these days. So, and again, Right from the old location, these guys have been great supporters of us, so we're glad to have them here, and we hope that you guys can make it out as well um, to their store and support them. And then we have Lauren, Lauren. and his wife, Deb. Deb's here. Um, I'm not much of a wine guy. I know if I drink it, I feel good, and that's about the extent of my wine goes. You like Kettle Valley. I like though. Kettle Valley. I do know that... When I see the wines coming in, it's pretty much his wines that we sell the most of and that we go through. I don't know why. I, I mean, you could look under our stairs at home. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so we're glad to have them here and uh, feature in their wines. And okay. So now we'll have the producers stand up and talk a little bit about their. Do you want to record this too? Can I stand right here? Yes. yes. Oh yeah, absolutely. The first thing that I want to say is I really believe that the chef is the mouthpiece of the producer. Because without the chef, you wouldn't know anything about us. Or you wouldn't know what good food can be. And so I think Adrian and Shannon are local heroes. Yes. <laughs> I agree, there's lots of people jumping on the wagon of organic, local, 100 mile, mm -hmm. uh, but there are those that talk about it and there are those that really do it. And it does take a sacrifice because we do everything by hand from scratch with real ingredients and real work. And that isn't cheap. It's not commodity farming. It's not where you have 4,000 acres of peas and so you earn your money on margins, on, on, on amounts, right? It's more hand labor, but we put the quality into it. So George is a dairy farmer from way back. And um, so he's the one who really knows how to... It's amazing how when you know what you do, you have to have kind of like an intuition for what you do. So George can walk through the barn, and he will know that a cow has a problem. He just will know. And we have a son-in-law that's training up to become a farmer, and just like... 
But we realize that you have to have a certain amount of innate knowledge that just comes from somewhere where you don't even know yourself. Like, how can you put something so wonderful together in the kitchen that no one else would think of? It just happens. But um, you have to be have that kind of skill in order to bring quality into it. You, anybody can, like, feed a cow and milk it. Well, maybe not anybody. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> but um, it takes more than that. It takes more than that. Um, so we do everything. Do you want to talk? <laughs> <laughs> And basically, um, about 10 years ago, we had to decide um, we were milking 65 cows, and that's when my cow came. And the border stopped closed to the border. Uh, yeah, so we couldn't export anymore to the States. And we were raising heifers, and I had equipment, and I worked for other farmers growing crops. So all of a sudden, it became a major problem that we. Uh, didn't have this extra income. So we had to decide, okay, are we going to move somewhere else where it's cheaper to produce, or do we change how we do it? So we uh, went from 65 cows milking them three times a day, and they would give about 32 liters per cow. We went to milking 25 cows, or give 20 liters. So our milk changed automatically to the more old-fashioned, high-protein, high-fat, and Deborah started making cheese. Then after a while, we decided, well, okay, we need some more different things, so then we started keeping goats. Well, I'm kind of megalomaniac, so mm -hmm. in, I started off with like 50 and ended up with about 500. <laughs> <laughs> so we only needed about 150, <laughs> and the surplus milk I was selling to Cholak, and I was just losing so much money. It was unbelievable. So anyway, we, we milk about 100 goats now. And then meanwhile, one, uh, we have five kids, and one of our sons lives in Alberta, and he was working in Fort Mac, making lots of money, and he wanted investment. So I said, well, I'll buy some land. So he bought some land in uh, Vauxhall near Tabor, and it's irrigated. And uh, we now have uh, four quarters out there. So we have about 600 acres of land out there. We grow our hay and bring it to Agassi, and we grow other grain now. And it's just how good things are in life. Uh, the first quarter was organic. So we auto he automatically got into organic, whereas I was trained in the 60s and 70s to kill everything with chemicals. Like, if you want anything killing, you form me an agency and I could kill it. Like, I had sprayers and, like, corn <laughs> planters, like, everything, right? So it's just how life is. All of a sudden, it doesn't seem to be working anymore. So we've gone to organic, and uh, basically we've gone back to the old-fashioned breeds. We have uh, Guernseys, Brown Swiss, and I never liked Jerseys because Jerseys were smaller, and they kind of race around all the time. And they get out, and if they if their gate is open, a Jersey will go, the gate's open, let's go, and they're like high-tailing it, literally with the tails up, and the Brown Swiss go, oh, is it, there's a gate open? Is that like... The whole team to go, we're not supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but the jerseys are down the road. Yeah. yeah, and they're smaller, so they won't fit in the parlor. But last year, we, we had difficulty getting more Guernseys. Because what happened is, I could go on about this forever. But, so basically, but basically, Once about... you've got dinner, you can... Uh, yeah, dinner. about uh, five years ago, um, no, more than that, about ten years ago, they wanted low-fat milk. Everybody wanted one percent milk. And in the business, we call it blue milk because there's nothing in it. It's like everybody wants. So then they did want high fat milk. So all the Guernseys in uh, BC, especially, and in Ontario, they went down to Oregon and California and to Florida. Because they produce higher fat in their milk. Right. So we lost all that. All that so, heritage. Yeah. So we managed to get. Uh, a few Guernseys together, and uh, and they're the reason that the milk is so beautiful, golden color. Like the cheese, the brie will have that golden, beautiful. They have higher beta carotene in their milk. They have more vitamin, natural vitamin D, and so it's a much more flavorful, healthy milk. 
So the Guernsey, the Brown Swiss, they have the old-fashioned protein, which maybe if anyone's allergic to dairy products, often it's the A1 protein. Can you guys just go home and search it? A2 protein is the old-fashioned, unadulterated protein in dairy. And we have customers that can only drink the milk we produce. They cannot drink other commercial milk because the old-fashioned protein has not been changed. Plus, we don't homogenize, which fractures the milk molecule so that your gut doesn't really know how to manage it. So many people, what the heck, why is everyone allergic to dairy or grain? What has happened in these last years that we all were growing up? Something happened. So we've kind of tried to go back to the old-fashioned way of farming, and we're finding that people are coming to us and going, my kids can only drink your milk. My baby threw up for two months till I discovered this, right? And we're finding out. Um, and so, we're, as George said, we're certifying organic, which should be coming through in a couple of months and unverified non-GMO. And we're raising our grain with our rich son. <laughs> the, uh, the irony is he works for Finning in Fort McMurray, like, you know, and makes so much money. We've never made that amount of money. He makes one, one day more overtime money than we make, like, in a month. Oh, it's great. Good to have. Yeah, good to have. Yeah. 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 invested it, you know, and it's good. So, so yeah. that's what we're doing. and. Um, we just think that slowly but surely, with people like yourselves around the table and people that are doing things in a way that has integrity, that we all need to come back there. And the thing is that everyone needs to remember, and thank you to Adrian and Shannon, everyone needs to remember without the farmer, we do not eat. And farming is not going well. In, when we st when George, like 20 years ago in BC, there were 800 and, 800 and something dairy farmers. Now there are less than 600. Well, when I came in, yeah. uh, I, like I emigrated, and I was in Ontario for a couple of years, then I came here, there was 1,800 farmers in BC. In the kids can't take it over because they can't make a living, and the land is too expensive, they don't have the expertise, they want to have a nice car and have time off too, yeah. farmers don't get that, so it's it's hard. So, thank you for supporting that. Can I ask a question? Yeah. No. Do you, do your cows get out of the barn as to graze? Yeah. We graze them about 200 plus days a year. Okay. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. If you have any questions, you can come and ask us. And you can always come and visit anytime. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. How I earn my dinner tonight at speaking. Here. So, yeah, my name is Jeremy, and I'm here with Sheila, and we run a business at a cooperative farm uh, just down the road here called. So the business is called Pitchfork Organic Farm, and the cooperative is Glen Valley Organic Farm Cooperative. And I, uh, yeah, so uh, I'd like to just give respect up to Adrian and Shannon here because. As I've been farming for eight years there, and before that I worked five years for a greenhouse, and we grew microgreens to restaurants. And for those five years, I, so I just kind of my initiation into the food production and the world of restaurant selling. And when I left there, I said, I don't want to sell the restaurant. Because I don't, selling to restaurants is very challenging. They, <coughs> they kind of, you know, chefs move around, restaurants go out of business, so they want something and then they don't want something, they don't pay their bills. And, you know, so I didn't, I, when I started farming, I said I can go to a farmer's market and, you know, sell directly to people who are going to give me money right away and then, you know, buy what I have. And for some reason, I, I, well, I got connected with them through another farm, Glorious Organics. They used to sell our shallots to them. And then I saw they moved here and I'm driving by one day and I'm like, oh, great, they're nearby. And so I stopped by and I just talked to them. And, and these guys are great because they, they don't do those things that I don't like. The restaurants. I hope there's no restaurateurs here. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and so I, we're very selective about restaurants in Southern because they, I drop off food, which you know, they take what's in season. When it's in season, they don't, you know, they don't worry about if it's too big or too small. It doesn't have to be baby, micro, perfect sizing. And so it's great. And then they write you, me a check every time stuff off, which is unheard of in the restaurant world. So, so it's really great working with them. And, uh, and it clears. 
Yeah. <laughs> Big go. <laughs> and so, yeah, and so, like, the fact that we're having a gumbo dinner in January is another testament of, like, how focused they are on, like, farm and local seasonal eating because, you know, it's easy to have a gumbo dinner in the summer. Yeah. And, you know, we got tomatoes and melons and beans, you know, like, everything's around, but, you know, what are you going to eat in January? And so, like, hopefully tonight we're going to <laughs> Some, you know, good presentation. Oh, we're, 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 we're having weeds. We're yeah. going to be eating weeds. Right? So, uh, so, which, by the way, is, is part of the seasonal, you know, eating. Yeah. It's like, you know, some people call them weeds, and, you know, weeds are, like, you know, things you don't want growing in an area. Like, that's a definition of a weed. And it changes from, you know, like, what's a weed here isn't a weed here because it's not growing there. But it's also the time of the year things are growing. So at this time of the year, you go out on the farm, there's not a lot of green things growing, right? And that's the one thing we lack in the farm, you know? We've got lots of storage crops that we eat, but we start craving greens. And so I was walking around the farm the other day, and you know, these things are growing now, which in the summertime are weeds, but because they're growing in the winter, are food. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I mean, there's very little of it, so hopefully everyone gets one or two weeds on their <laughs> table tonight. But yeah, the one is like minor slightest, we call it, Clintonia, and another one's upland cress, and there's another one called chickweed, stellaria. Oh my gosh. Chickweed? Oh. Oh. It's so George good. George used to spray it to death. <laughs> well, now you can harvest it and sell it for $15 a pound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's still drove me crazy. <laughs> but your parents would have eaten it. Yeah. Yeah? My parents ate it in the 30s. Well, yeah. George, you're eating it tonight. I just added to it. Uh, in the old days, uh, it didn't grow much. Because we farm differently mm -hmm. now, because we got chemicals, it grows everywhere. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's really all I have to say. And I'd like to, yeah, you know, thank them, and I'm thanking you guys for coming. You guys coming here and supporting them and eating winter healthy food is kind of special. So.
I like to see the passion that's involved with the actual producers. Uh, I, I know that Tour just is passionate about what we do. We tell to uh, a lot of the sausage makers that are very passionate about their product. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> you were you and Patricia were the first chef's table on New Year's Eve, the first year in 2004. And the second and the third. And always ten, ten years, and then we wore them out. <laughs> I think it was ten years, right, from 2004. It's pretty incredible. Um, we have Lauren. Our, oh, everyone, I think, has met Lauren this evening. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. 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 Uh, Adrian and Janet. Thank um, you. What I hear when you guys chat, which is which is fun from from my perspective, I have two backgrounds. I'm a geek, I'm a computer guy. I've spent 30 years in IT, and in the last few years, have felt the need to do something a little bit more organic. We now own 16 acres in Port Langley, and we are developing a farm. I'm going to be talking to you about it. I have three goats. <laughs> 32 <laughs> goats. Um, Four turkeys. Four turkeys. <laughs> we used to have five. One disappeared. Thank you, Jimmy. It wasn't one of us. I 